guys. Welcome to the AVA Drake Podcast. This is Shannon. I'm Joe. And thank you for joining us. So now, we're going to start off with our very first podcast ever. As you can see, we're still working on our set. We've uh, you've seen a few videos we put out recently. So now let's go ahead and jump right into what we're going to be talking about this week. I think one of the big ones on everyone's mind right now is the launch of Ryzen 2. Yes. So now, Joe, you, being the fact that we did a lot of testing on this, what's your initial feeling, like the knee-jerk reaction on uh, the launch of Ryzen 2? I think it feels great, especially due to the fact that it feels like AMD is really starting to listen to their core audience a lot more rather than just kind of push a product with an agenda and say, hey, we did a thing. What's next? Okay. We're, um, because we're kind of stating our own opinion on this, where do you feel like, uh, I feel like more than anything, I I'm happy to see that this launch went really well with the ability for better memory performance, better right. overall, uh, right. better memory latency, better memory clock speeds across the board. Mm. That, that speaks a lot to the engineering capability, but how do you feel compared to what we have seen from other launches? Like for instance, the very first Ryzen launch, which was a brand new core for them, so I understand there was a lot of changes. Right. How do you feel this one went versus the previous? Well, much smoother. I mean, especially as a system builder, we had access to a lot of the things we needed to to be kind of kept up and brief on things. Um, AMD has been pretty accommodating. I think you could agree with with giving us the tools necessary to make sure we understand their product fully, rather than just kind of dropping a product and saying, "Hey, here's the thing. Read reviews." Yeah, that's some manufacturers do that. And it's th that's you know. that's one of the things that's really crazy. A lot of people assume that like you know we have things you know like a year ahead of time. And a lot of manufacturers drop them on us, you know, right before, like, reviewers. But yeah. one thing AMD has done really well is, as you know, we went through multiple spins of the CPU and got, like, different versions and saw the actual incremental increases. So mm -hmm. we can actually speak to the fact that we've watched this actually get faster and faster and better right. and more refined. Mm -hmm. So now, even though this is the product right here, I still feel like there's room that it's going to get better. <laughs> yeah, that's not awkward at all. So I still feel like it could get much better. But one of the things is that, um, like for instance, uh, gaming performance, that's something we were actually discussing a little earlier. Yeah. Um, how do you feel like, you know, looking at this product, I mean, so many people look at gaming like, you know, it's its own whole entity, but they have, I don't think they understand, you know, that game, a lot of games, <laughs> a lot of games simply don't utilize higher and higher clock speeds now are especially multi-threaded CPUs. I feel like that's I, I feel like that's still something being adopted. What do you think? Yeah, it's definitely something that's still worked on. You always have a AAA title that they put a lot of, a lot of effort into multi-core utilization and I, a part of me feels like AMD should kind of step back a little bit from multi-core utilization and focus more on single-core performance like Intel does, but I know that's kind of always been their wheelhouse. They've always focused on optimizing multi-core utilization. I think it's going to take either a lot more demand from the industry or it's going to take a lot of convincing with the, the, the way the market is going for them to do something differently. Well, and that's one thing, you know, if you look at, I mean, I hate to mention it, but if you look at AMD FX, I mean, there's, <laughs> they, it was a big jump from going to Ryzen. I yeah, mean, it was. <laughs> I, I wanted one back in the day when they came out bad. I was broke and uh, living paycheck to paycheck and I was getting ready to sell my furniture for one, I remember. I had, a, I had a FX 9590, and I'm pretty sure even, I mean, that thing was specced to hit 5 gigahertz. I had it on water cooling, and it didn't throttle to 5. Yeah. I had it on LN2, it got it to 5. But like that. That was, yeah. that was about it. But right. when you look at it now, it's like, granted, these chips don't necessarily clock to 5, but also they overclock themselves. Mm -hmm. And in all honesty, this is something, once again, um, overclocking. I know you and I both are pretty well versed in overclocking. We spend a lot of time overclocking, you know, screwing with our own rigs. Mm -hmm. And... Overclocking, I feel nowadays, is a pretty passe thing. It's like it's not really needed for gaming anymore because it simply how fast the processor, the core, the core logic is, it simply doesn't apply. It's not as applicable as it used to be back when you were pushing Celerons to get that performance because you didn't want to spend you know a thousand dollars or what have you on an extreme edition CPU. Right. So with that, with that being said, I mean I know you still overclock your system, but. Yes. Do you really feel it's necessary at this point? Not at all. I, I more or less do it for a couple of reasons. One, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy taking something that wasn't meant to work in the fashion and forcing it to, to work in that fashion. Um, I mean, and yes, I get that, that joy, joy feeling of pushing something, uh, getting better performance for my dollar. I mean, every who doesn't want better value for the product, you know? Um, so I don't think it's necessary in terms of will my PC run 
drastically better if I do this? No. But I feel it's necessary for me to feel good about my PC. Maybe that's just me, but is what it is, I guess. And I, I think that's truly applicable to gaming performance. Well, let's say you're doing rendering or, or digital audio work. That's where I feel that higher frequency really could help. So, you're right. like, for instance, when we build systems or DVD Direct, we offer overclocking services. And part of that being that a lot of people utilize their systems for rendering, encoding, mm -hmm. what, and, you know, all those things. And when you up the frequency, you can actually up the amount of work it does every clock cycle. Right. So there's value to that. Huge. And one thing with Ryzen is still we are at a point with Ryzen 2 where they don't leave a lot on the table. So... I've overclocked them. They hit about 4.2-ish across, across the board. I've already said that in multiple videos. But mm -hmm. I, do you really feel like that's a limiting factor? Or do you feel like with gamers buying these, obviously gaming, we already talked about, doesn't require the higher speed. Do you really feel like that limitation of not going, let's say we're 8700K, could do 5 gigahertz, as we've seen, yeah. when you delay them and whatnot? Right. Do you feel that's enough of a determining factor that people really should steer away from Ryzen? I mean, it's... It, it Tomato, tomato, to me, really. Just because of the simple aspect that you're going to have applications that will either take advantage of multi-core performance combined with clock speed, or you'll have some that only look at clock speed, in which multi-core performance it doesn't matter, and then you'll have others that are just uh, multi-core bias, and they, they don't care about the clock speed. So, to me, if you're a professional looking at an AMD Ryzen 2 processor, you're obviously looking at the multi-core performance, and, and not a whole lot. So, uh, most applications that will take advantage of multi-core performance they're not going to really care about clock speed once you hit a certain breaking point. So like 4 gigahertz, once you hit that, anything over that is just going to kind of be minuscule returns, and performance will actually diminish along with your thermals, obviously. Uh, so no, I don't think you should stop thinking about it. It really is just the use case scenarios are there for the processor, and it's a product that should just be utilized for what it is. Well, since I have access to the uh, AMD marketing deck, I can tell you, you pretty much, which is great, because that means they're obviously delivering the message out there, because I know you haven't seen it, and that's pretty much what they're putting out there. They're saying, yeah, like, know. you know, hey, if you're a creator, if you're doing this stuff, you know, there's there's a lot of room to have your system expand beyond right. what you have in other options, such yeah. as the Intel parts. You have an eight-core part that can step in the same ground that Intel's offering six-core parts or even lesser parts. Mm -hmm. And you can have this awesome multi-threaded performance, whether it's uh, via rendering, digital audio, you name it. And I feel like that's where the true value lies. The problem is a lot of people automatically see a gaming metric, and that's their only measure. They don't look beyond it. Sadly. Yeah, but I mean, and most people are going to look at the benchmarks that apply to them. Admittedly, uh, when, I, when I look at reviews for personal reasons, I look at gaming. I want to see, because I'm the kind of person that I get bored with things easily as it relates to my system. I either have to keep tweaking it, or I can't leave it alone, or I find something I have to tweak, and sometimes it comes down to hardware. So, yes, I want an excuse to spend a lot of money on a PC if I have it. Sorry, sweetie. But I mean, it, it, that's the truth. That's just who I am as a person. You realize she's probably watching. And, and that's okay. <laughs> that's why I apologize. But at the end of the day, um, I, I, I don't know. It's it, it, For professional use, I do look at like the synthetic benchmarks and CPU bench and Cinebench and things like that because I do. I have a lot of customers and, and businesses that I work with that they have specific needs, but like anybody else, they're on a budget. And sometimes it's it's a challenge to be able to find a good balance between price and expectation. And CPUs like Ryzen, they allow you to do that effortlessly. So it's it's a huge win. And, the, the, and building on what you said, I feel like with Ryzen, and this is one of the things I actually had discussions last time I went over to visit them. Mm -hmm. I had discussions with some of their engineers. Uh, and one of the things they said was, you know what, we didn't leave a lot on the table. We made it so that it boosts up and it goes there. You right. don't necessarily need to overclock it. And that's cool. And the great part is you can actually overclock this almost basically to its max boost clock sure. across all cores. Yeah. Now, granted, you don't get as much headroom. But I feel like after with our discussion, the the marginal or minute returns versus what you get, you know, if you're talking professional applications, mm -hmm. can easily be looked past once you take and going to, once you take in to the uh, once you take into the fact that you get far many more you get many more cores and more, much more threads mm -hmm. for the same dollar so it really comes down to as they optimize this architecture people being able to learn about it and figure out what works best for them because I, I really can't talk badly about Intel's offerings I mean their 7700k is solid I mean, yeah, I, I mean absolutely. obviously you got to delete them that's one thing with Ryzen you can't delete these things they're soldered it's, I mean that's okay though that's part of the fun <laughs> to me for Intel processors is like Again, part of that aspect of me that feels like I'm going to take something that you shouldn't do, and I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to get better results out of it. Like, deletting is, is part of the process to me. So the point to where, you know, we have 
all those tools to be able to do it in, in a very precise and professional manner, and it's a service we offer in our systems, right? Um, that don't even require you to pull out a blade. And so I still pull out a razor blade, and I, I don't even consider those tools because I'm old-fashioned. I like to do that. Like, blade, processor, great idea, right? No problem. And then I'm done. Well, you know, it's only $2,000. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, okay, now, now we've stepped into that, the whole DIY aspect. Being that Ryzen soldered, being that Ryzen, you don't really need to overclock it. It, yeah. it just does its thing, and there's not a lot of headroom there anyways. Right. Do you feel like that loses some luster to you as an extreme enthusiast? Because there's multiple niche, uh, there's multiple small niches. One of them being extreme enthusiasts, which is part where you and I both fit, yeah. is when you're pushing things to that kind of extreme, do you lose any value in your mind seeing the fact that you cannot push it that far? I mean, l l look at the company that that we embody, being AVA Direct Custom Computer. So anything I can take and modify it in any way, that I'm all for it. So yeah, it does lose a little bit of its luster to not be able to to, de to deal it rise in or do anything to really improve thermals of the chip itself outside of you know slapping a better cooler on it and, and hoping for the best. But at the same time, it's it doesn't really matter because the focus for rising chips isn't overclocking. For the most part, it's 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 just something I feel AMD put on there to say they can do it and it's possible, which is great. Um, especially when you think back on like the FX processor and, I, and it was the 200 watt one. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the FX9590, yeah. the one yeah. that you literally had to cool like with a, a nuclear cooling solution. Basically. <laughs> that thing, that thing was rough. Well, well, it was it was rough just because it was advertised at a speed, and then you get it and you you try to boot it, and you're like, that is a challenge, and this is why I purchased it for this, and I can't do it. Why can't I do it? Um, but so, and, and that's, I'm not saying that in a negative way for AMD, you know, a AMD has come a very long way, uh, since that point in time. And I think that's something we kind of need to consider a lot, uh, when it comes to these, these new products coming out is where we, where they've come from, you know, the, the places they've gone since that point in time. And it's great. The fact that we're even discussing Ryzen processors within the same realm as Intel is a huge achievement, I feel like. The fact that we're uh, discussing AMD CPUs in general is a surprise for yeah. me because I was really scared when I I had the FX ninety five ninety and it's scared. it was it was it, no it was scared scared, <laughs> scared was the definition of running that processor. I had a three sixty AIO at the time because at the time I wasn't here and I yeah. we had a three we were on the first of three sixty AIO and I'm like sweet I got something to cool the ninety five ninety right nope <laughs> not a chance in hell. I mean at least you tried at no, least. It, you had to, you had to try. Had oh, to try. it it tried, it tried and failed, and then and the radiator physically felt hot, and I'm like, well, this is probably a bad sign. I'm just going to stop doing this. I mean, I mean, if you put it in a cold room where you don't have a whole lot of heat efficiency, then you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. In Siberia, yes, yeah. I could see, I could see the 9590 possibly with like I don't know a Mora radiator, you know, a three by uh, the nine by one twenty. Just a sheet radiator that encompasses the size of your wall. In in dry ice water, you might have something <laughs> that would run consistently like five gigahertz. <laughs> Uh, looks like Ernie, actually, you know Ernie, he uh, did some of our uh, cartoons. Hi, he's, Ernie. <laughs> he's asking, uh, would you recommend this chip for a workhorse PC with focusing on editing video and video work, including motion graphics? Your, my, your opinion first. My, my initial reaction is absolutely, especially if you've seen some of the reviews uh, that are already posted. Uh, the, the video editing scores and, and the results are, are great. Granted, I think results vary, and... I will say that AMD is not the winner of, of those benchmarks in, in every single fashion, but it's close enough for the price point, you know? When it comes to comparing, even like the 2600X, uh, it still gets close to an 8700K, and even though the 2700X bridges that gap and sometimes beats it, for something within the, the mid $200 range that gets as close as a processor that's mid 400 I mean, for people that need that performance and can't always afford every single dollar you have to put in a PC to achieve that performance, it's huge. It's a huge game changer. So, uh, TLDR, yes. <laughs> I would I would agree. I, th I definitely think it's a great workhorse chip. I think it's something that put in a workstation scenario is actually a really awesome product because as long as you build it properly, one thing you got to understand is Ryzen with the Infinity Fabric is uh, it's insanely quick if you get the right memory. For mm -hmm. instance, running 3200 or so memory, that's about where Ryzen 1 Ryzen 2, um, I found, you know, like a 72700X, I found you can get 3400-ish, but 3200 still about the sweet spot I found. And that affects everything because that affects your cache latency. That affects everything across the board because that, um, that Infinity Fabric allows the CCX, the core complexes, all to communicate 
all effectively and allows it to transmit data between the shared cache. Mm. So with that being said, you can take that and you can really get some awesome workstation performance, especially doing video editing, things like that. That's actually some of the tests I did with Blender, um, what Blender was rendering, right. and uh, also with compression tests, things where this processor truly shines because it's multi-core aware. But if you have applications that are, um, let's say, especially legacy applications where you're doing like uh, engineering work and there are still some out there that simply are not aware of above like three, four threads, those unfortunately, I feel like you're still gonna need that higher IPC performance, mm -hmm. but that's a really edge case at this point. So many yeah. applications are now available, whether it's Maya and things like that, where they simply will use as much of your system as you can get. Right, and not to mention, at that point, if you start considering a processor based on memory frequency and bandwidth, that's going to be a very specific use case scenario, at least based on, on my experience. And a lot of times, if you have applications, especially the most of them are Linux-based, first off, and, um, and, and science, involve scientific calculations and data analysis or analysis, and at that point, they're going to recommend very specific hardware down to the chipset, down to the processor. So I mean, you're really not even going to consider Ryzen at that point. And and again, it's a very small audience and, and group of people that even would utilize processors for their memory bandwidth anyway. So. And to add on top of that also, when you're talking that cal that uh, calculation work, things like, uh, let's say, uh, a lot of it, like uh, oil and gas mining, things like mm -hmm. that, where they do that kind of calculation, now that's all moving to GPGPU anyway. That's yep. all GPU compute. So CUDA. a lot of it, <laughs> CUDA, <laughs> OpenCL, let's give a little love to AMD with, you know, the right. fact that they run the open standard. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's another thing with AMD, and you got to give them credit, is a lot of their technology, they keep very open, so it allows you to work with them very fluidly. It allows you to uh, be able to utilize a lot more tools without having specific required certifications. Mm -hmm. And that's also a plus. If you're looking for that open environment feel, I feel like that's where AMD is definitely going to get garner a lot of respect from people like the Linux community, things like that, where you're not having to have specifically, I don't want to say signed because you always want signed drivers, but no. having specific compatibility and not something that's a proprietary technology that you're locked into, I feel like that's something that really detracts people from using a product. I agree. Oh, Kevin loves Gouda. That's... <laughs> I mean, it's not my favorite. I'm not really a big cheese man. I don't know why. I like cheddar, um, no Swiss. You, well, you can hate on me all you want. Walking into your office, I'm pretty sure you might have some sort of lactose issue. I'm not sure. I mean, it could be. It just depends <laughs> on the kind of day I'm having. Sometimes it's mood-driven. Sometimes it's it's just, you know, too much Chipotle. So, oh. I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I'm going to start working from home. Probably a good, probably a good idea. And I apparently need to work from a toilet, so. <laughs> Why is this happening already? No, no, you started it. Uh, beyond that, I think the other thing, uh, one of the th other things we can talk on uh, Rise, and I think one of the last and most important like changes has really been the change to the IMC. Um, I noticed in the testing that we were going from mid seventies on nanoseconds of latency down mm -hmm. to about sixty eight, sixty seven, and while that doesn't seem like a huge number. When you're talking things like latency across not just the memory, but also I saw reductions of up to 10 to 30 percent on the actual cache levels, mm -hmm. which is what gives it its IPC performance increase. Right. That's actually quite huge for a processor. Yeah. Oh, Kevin, he's asking, is this chip going to pull people away from Intel? I'm going to let you just again uh, go ahead and give your insight on that. I mean, it's, there's always a strong possibility. I mean, only time's going to tell in my opinion, uh, they're headed in the right direction, that's for sure. I mean, especially from what I see uh, managing our sales department, I, we're seeing a lot more orders for, for AMD products than we've seen within the last five years. So, I mean, it's a, they've always been pretty heavy with Opteron. You'll always have companies that, that still prefer kind of the Opteron architecture um, and, and the Epic, obviously, moving forward. But, yeah, I think this is... A very strong case for AMD to start pulling a lot of business away from Intel, and I hope they keep doing it. If anything, just based on then what the whole industry has basically been shouting from the mountaintops for the last decade, and it's the competition. We need better, more competition between chip manufacturers, um, you know, so we can get away with this whole TikTok regimen that Intel, you know, was doing previously, and we actually get real gains for our money. I mean, granted, even if it comes, I mean, in my opinion, even if it comes with a higher price point, even if rather than uh, jumping from you know the high end i7 to the next i7, it's like oh an additional four hundred dollars, no big deal. Even if it were double to me, and the huge performance gains were there, I would be okay with that, truly. Yeah, and I think uh, we've seen that actually. If you look at once Ryzen, and especially once Ryzen Threadripper, since it's part of the Ryzen family, was launched, mm -hmm. you saw the huge shift 
and the way reports were leaking out and everything about the new X-299 chipset before it was launched. Right. I almost didn't believe it. I thought it was all speculation at that point, truly. All of a sudden, it went through the roof as far as them offering core, higher core counts, different clock speeds versus the reporting one. Now, I know that's all early rumor stuff, but it felt a lot like a knee-jerk reaction. Was it? I mean, well, you know. If you, if you work at Intel, please type in here. I'm sure I have a few <laughs> I have a few friends on Facebook. Please uh, type, much let love. me let, <laughs> much love Intel. But uh, yeah, you guys got to step it up because Ryzen two is uh, solid. And I feel like um, to answer Kevin's question that yeah, it could pull people away from Intel. Absolutely, I think um, there is a very strong value proponent in all of the Ryzen series processors, and they have actually doubled down on that now with Ryzen two. I feel like it's really going to push people much harder to consider a um, Ryzen series product versus an Intel product. I mean, the first generation Ryzen, there was so many bad reports going on with memory, stuff like that. So people were really apprehensive. People were really on the fence of getting it. And I feel like we've really hit a point to where um, these are now very viable products. I mean, at launch, yeah. there was very minimal memory issues. I think across the board, Ryzen has started to really become a kick-ass product. And I think it's going to continue to do so mm -hmm. through the lifespan of AM4, which is great. That's another thing. How annoying is it when every time we're building systems, every time a new chipset launches, every time a new, or not even chipset, but every time a new CPU launches, a refresh, you got a totally different series of boards. Now that's not saying like X470, yes, there's a new board for Ryzen 2, but you can still use 370 without a problem. I mean, it's it's not ideal, that's for sure. It's kind of starting to feel like when the FCC had to step in and tell cell phone manufacturers, stop making proprietary chargers because you're killing the planet. Like, I feel like at some point they need to, to consider something like that. Like, I know business is business, and I know it could be for design issues most likely. I don't know things um, necessarily on a deep engineering level for board designs as you do. So you correct me if I'm wrong. But I, I feel like it's just boards are changing and sockets are changing at a much faster pace than they used to. And it makes it pretty difficult for people to upgrade their systems and, and minimize costs to do so. But my biggest my biggest pet peeve is the bracket changes. You know, I think... Um, sorry, AMD, but you know when Threadripper came out, and you, your choices <laughs> of brackets and adapters, and some manufacturers, and I won't name names, claiming like, yes, we have a bracket, can we get it? No, you can't because it's not available yet. Okay, so you don't have a bracket. Um, it, w it was really frustrating because you, you have a great opportunity to have so many applications for Threadripper, especially, and in, in Ryzen as well. But without the bracket support and the, the ability to, to use cooling mechanisms within a wide range, you're kind of stuck. A little bit. Well, not to mention Ryzen is about the size of a hockey puck. It's yeah. gigantic. I mean, and my, as my wallet a, as is durable small. as a hockey puck, apparently, compared to the last video we shot. So, <laughs> <laughs> did, it did it taste like a hockey puck? That wasn't that wasn't a Threadripper. Thank goodness. Oh, that okay. was that was actually an old ass Athlon chip. Oh, okay. Honest. Um, well, did it taste like a hockey puck? You didn't answer my question. No, it actually tasted kind of like when you have a metal filling. You know that weird, <laughs> yeah. weird funny taste? I was yeah. just sitting there, I'm like, ah, that was, that was. <laughs> it was like Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> and it, not to mention, I had that ranch dip from lunch, which was somewhat, at least made the, made the chip palatable at some point. <laughs> um, Kevin's asking, uh, let's make it simple. Ryzen on War Thunder. Ryzen can definitely run War Thunder. And then again, a toaster could run War Thunder at this point. So. <laughs> An atom processor. I'm pretty sure my cell phone can run War Thunder. So <laughs> Ryzen definitely, yeah, go I'm on War sure Thunder. pretty sure my daughter's LeapFrog can run War Thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what those ones? It's like a speaking spell. It's like, burp, and, uh, you pressed L. Play with me. No, it's, <laughs> it's one of those uh, tablets that's for kids, and it's real durable, and they can drop it, and they can kick it, and they put it in water, and it plays basic, it's Android operating system, and it plays basic stuff, but really what it's used for primarily is Netflix. So. so what you're saying is we need that for production in RMA so that we can stop breaking the, um, the tablets we may have. I probably should say no comment in that regard because I really don't <laughs> want to get in trouble with HR for obvious reasons. That's 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 a, that's a safe call. Yes. I, uh, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll have that discussion after this podcast. Okay. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Sounds awesome. There's other reasons for that too. Yeah. So beyond, beyond Ryzen, we know, you know, obviously um, we have the board that uh, over here, we have a separate camera on the uh, Crosshair uh, 7 because uh, VII, yeah, that's 7. Just making sure. Uh, <laughs> after after how many mistakes I had with that wonderful Roman numeral crap. It's um, okay. I still love you. <laughs> that's actually a really awesome board. It's a, it is. It's designed like really well, especially if you look like, if you look at the way that everything has been just kind of cleaned up. You know, you see how the CPU socket area is usually just populated with so many things. And it looks real clean and sleek. And, and the way that they cover up the I.O. panel so you don't have just kind of some annoying VRMs or, or MOSFETs in the way to kind of take focus away from, like, wire management and things like that, I think it does a really good job. 
Um, and yeah, eight four. Sorry. Okay. Now, my question would be, um, which which of the M twos would you assume you would use right away? Uh, let's make sure we keep it on the board, uh, if possible. So, which M2 would you, this is one This is one nitpick I had. You didn't get to see the review video. We just shot it, so we haven't actually published it. So you haven't seen what I said about this. Which, just because I want to kind of litmus test, because maybe right. it's me making a false judgment. Sure. Which M2 would you uh, put the drive in if you were putting a single M2 on this board? Now, I'm going to make two statements. I'm going to say what I think it should be, and I'm going to say what I, I'm guessing it probably is. Oh, okay. Uh, that, but it's probably actually that, right? Uh, you can use this one. However, right. if you have SLI... Uh, oh, this no. will this will knock the second slot down to X4. No! And as we know, the lovely, lovely people at uh, NVIDIA, they uh, don't allow SLI on an X4 card. What? So you basically would lose your SLI capability if you accidentally installed it here. And imagine the nightmare if you have a card here and here, and then you got to pull the card out of here, especially, let's say, it's water-cooled, just to put your M2 there. Bruh. That's... I that mean, was the one. Uh, that was probably one of the only nitpicks I had about this board. I think the board overall is an excellent board and it's really solid. Sure. But that was one of those things where I looked at it and it's like it shared lanes in that way. And I'm just like, it seems like common sense would tell me you'd want it right up here where the cooler is and everything. Absolutely. But it's unfortunately that's number two. Yeah. Or, the one thing I have to give AMD credit for as well is I don't know if they have uh, any input or or any kind of say in the design of the Threadripper boards, but I really like what they did with the perpendicular standing N.2 socket, or like they had like the the C dim or like the dim three that's next to and to the right side of all the existing dims on the board that allows you to install N.2 cards on the side. Because some people have complained that like it's a huge eyesore, like oh it's just a big dim card adapter with M.2s. But what it does is especially for like system builders or enthusiasts uh, that just can't stop tweaking their builds, you have access to your M.2 right there, and it doesn't require you to move remove cards. And if your system's liquid cool, forget it. You, at that point, you, you might just let the card die and then just plug in a SATA drive and move on with life. Because you're not going to disconnect all the tubes and drain it if you're busy and you just have better things to do, I guess. So. Okay, we've got a few questions rolling in, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer one of them. Dwayne from uh, Modders, Inc. Hi, Dwayne. <laughs> he, I'm, I'm going I'm to let you answer this first, and I'll answer mine. Okay. Um, is your home system Intel? If so, are you ready to change to Ryzen Gen 2? I'm almost there, Dwayne. I am really... Really close. Um, Threadripper was, was almost the turning point for me. And I, I come from a background to where I was pro AMD from a child. My brother always gave me his hand-me-downs. And it was always AMD. And I remember the AMD slot processor I had. It was an Athlon, and it ran at like 750 megahertz. And uh, I really want to go back to AMD again. The, the child in me says, please, please AMD. Do, do, do it. Just do the thing. Get, get above Intel, even if it's just a, a small increment. Do, do something... That, that makes me look at Intel, <laughs> you know? Um, so, but no, sadly, my home PC is Intel. Um, it's been great for me, and it's, it, I have no complaints, really. What's your specs? Just well, to give people, because obviously they want to know. Like, all right, I have the 7940X, okay? okay. Uh, 14 core overclock to 4.7, and uh, I have a, a Titan X Pascal, I have 64 gigs of memory, I have uh, an ASRock OC formula board, which I love at the fact that I can run my memory at stock specs, and overclock without problems. I have uh, uh, Samsung M.2. Uh, it was the original like 940s that came out. Oh, you have the 950 Pro, yeah. Uh, the 950, yeah. And uh, I have a four terabyte black drive that I just used to dump data on that I always forget about majority of the time. I have a Samsung two terabyte SSD that I use strictly for games and it'd probably get laughed at, but I just have this ever since I went to, to SSD storage to start playing games on it. It, by happenstance, I was playing Grand Theft Auto 4 because I never played it because the frame rates were just poop on consoles. I had no interest <laughs> in it. And when I went back to play it on PC, I had a hard drive originally. And I'm sorry. I noticed that, no, right? <laughs> I had texture pop-ins and whatever, and I'm a bit of a graphics snob. You know? my, my wife makes fun of me for all the time. So I'm like, oh, look at the difference that you pick out so you can just walk away, and that's that. Um, I noticed all those differences. And when I jumped to uh, a crucial... SSD when prices started to drop and a 128 gig was like a dollar per gig and I was like oh, 128 dollars for a 128 gig sign me up and uh, notice that when I loaded into the maps like there were no more texture pop-ins things were there there was no you get to a point in the maps in Grand Theft Auto 4 with the PC and it'd be like stop loading and you'd be like okay that didn't exist with an SSD and that was the turning point for me so I will never game off of a hard disk ever again <laughs> okay um, oh, well, it's all liquid cooled, hardline liquid cooled. 
Yeah, so. you, you actually did a really awesome job with that. I was going to say, like, the one, like, major show piece was, like, the, all the hardline liquid cooling that you did. And you spent yeah. the time here. We were working on it. Right. I was like, that's the one thing you didn't mention. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I still feel like it's a work in progress. So, you know, I also grew up uh, playing video games in, in my, my youth. And one of the biggest series I'm into is Resident Evil. So the PC is actually themed after Umbrella Core, you know, as you know. So the theme is... is I think next red podcast. Next podcast, we gotta have a picture of that. We show. should, yeah. I'll bring in a picture, and it was red and white, or at least we will show one in the video. And, and um, it's red and white tubes, and I used Thermal Takes LED RGB fittings to be able to alternate the colors between the tubes. Never again. Yeah, no, sorry. I mean, Thermal Take, you made a great product. It was a great idea, but your execution of the way that you had to install the tubes uh, literally made Never. me question why I was still alive and why I was still trying to build what I was building. But I got I, through it. Everything's I, okay. I was pretty sure we were both ready to pretty much hang ourselves with the cables that kept breaking off of those fittings. We, I have to give Thermal Take credit because, um, and this may sound bad, the two times I had to arm my fittings <laughs> because of that happening, the first time they were like unacceptable and just overnighted fittings without question and it was a full box of fittings that cables were ripped off of, a full six fittings. And maybe I kind of fat fingered a few. Maybe I was just really frustrated with the fact that I, I was squeezing my tiny little sausage fingers into little places of the case where they shouldn't be shoved. And uh, I got it to work. Um, and then the second time, I was like, hey, I did it again. And they're like, all right, this time you're going to have to pay for him. I'm like, all right, fine. And I paid for him. Uh, I got him in four days, swapped him out, gave it back. They, they gave me my money back. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it all is well. And the execution of, of the system turned out okay for me. And it was the first build that I really put a lot of time and effort into the, into the design because my previous builds, I just kind of picked up designs as I went. Like, maybe I can do this with it. Now that it's like that, maybe I can do that. And this, I had a concept before I even started. And the only downfall is, is I thought I could legitimately finish this system in under two days. And two days turned into two weeks because of the problems I kept running into. But the, other than that, I had fun. I got to make the point. This right here is exactly what it's like to work here, too. <laughs> Hearing stories like this. Yeah. Now, uh, my home system is Intel as well, admittedly. I mean, what my main, my main, 7980XE. Oh. d -lated, Wow. Um, monoblock. Bring out the big guns. And then I have my mobile system, which is the one I took over Chad's house when, yeah. we, were, when we were gaming, because yeah, yeah. PUBG is life. Um, hi, Chad. Hi, Chad. If he's watching, he probably is, maybe. Yeah. Um, but that one's an 8600K, or 8700K. And I can definitely say that, you know what, Rhett, I am seriously considering putting a Ryzen 2 into it and see yeah. how it performs, see uh, actual, you know, because admittedly, the new Aegis Code came out, I had to retest everything, as you know, when we, I'm like, holy crap, we have like two days before we get to shoot this video for launch. Right. So, rebenched everything I could, which is mostly productivity mm -hmm. and like 3D Mark. I would love to see how this thing actually plays, games like PUBG and things like that to get sure. the real world. And as you know, we have a blog coming up. I'm hoping to post some of the performance numbers in there as well with the with the gaming benchmarks included oh, sure. or updated over time. Right. So mine has NVMe drives. I'm not going to go through all that because I don't want to kill our time. So we'll just say I have a couple systems. All of them are Intel at this moment. I do have a Threadripper test bench, which I am building into a system. But now I'm super excited with Ryzen 2 and makes me even more excited seeing this, what they're going to do with Threadripper 2. There's one other thing that I want to say excites me the most. Oh boy. About these processors. This. This right here. Oh, it comes with an actual decent cooler. It comes not just with a decent cooler. Yeah, don't sit down on the table like I did and get thermal paste. It right. comes with a cooler. 2600X, no problem, cooler. 2700X, no problem, cooler. 2700, yeah. cooler. 2600, cooler. It actually has like an, a direct touch heat pipe base, copper heat piped cooler which unfortunately no matter how much you spend on certain other platforms you don't even get a damn cooler no, i mean you don't no, get you one don't. and that's, I, I, the, I, that's I, think not... that's, I think it's ludicrous truly really. <laughs> like how could you go from and i won't name names but you know who you are how could you go from <laughs> you know thanks for spending a thousand dollars on a processor here's a sweet cooler to make sure you have something to go by until you figure out what you're going to do with your build or maybe your life uh, no, it's just, hey, thanks for spending the money. Fend for yourself. It's like, I'm going to throw you in a boat and give you no paddles, and then just off you go into, you know, the, the rustling waters. So. But to be to be fair, this is way more sexier than the stock coolers on other platforms. But, uh, hey, that's mine. Leave it alone. Uh, just making sure we're not going to have to file any sexual <laughs> harassment lawsuits. Because, <laughs> Threat, uh, you know, this cooler is just kind of looking at you uh, kind of weird for the It's kind of looking at me side-eyed. I'm not yeah, sure about this. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, you're on the brink of licking your lips, and this thing wants to hide behind a box, so... 
Well, Threadripper admittedly also comes with an AIO bracket for Azatec style coolers. And it doesn't awesome. come with it doesn't come with a cooler though. And that's but still, I, I get it, I get it. So I guess I'm gonna put my foot in my mouth there because AD's <laughs> like, well, <laughs> Threadripper, but at least they gave you a bracket. You know, you're like, oh man. How, man. how does how does crow taste? <laughs> I was waiting. I mean, you, you you delve into that. I'm like, there we it, go. It, taste, it tastes a little bit like chili peppers and mothballs, but we'll, we can tap on that at a later date. It, but it, just the fact that they give you a bracket, if you have like an existing Asatec based pump cooler, cool, now you can use it. Like you're not expected to drop an additional hundred fifty dollars on something to keep your build practically exactly where it's at, other than you know the obvious and the processor. But and the other thing about the sexy cooler is it is actually a full RGB cooler which can plug in your motherboard or plug in under its own power and just if you don't have a motherboard which if you're buying a motherboard even close to recently, every damn board has RGB, so yeah. good luck finding one without it, let's say that. Unicorn boards. Yeah, but you know what the good thing is most of them have software you can turn it off, which is my first yes. step normally. <laughs> I don't I don't turn off the RGB um, per se. I keep the LEDs, I just keep it at a certain theme. So like my theme is and my case is the case is black. And then it's red and white, so I just have like the AS Rock OC formula board sitting on red, and it's just a solid color. But yeah, yeah. I don't want it to switch to all the spectrums of the rainbow, because I'm just going to feel like it's a Toucan Sam PC. I have a feeling Ashley's going to end up speaking up in this video, because right now my Corsair fans are like, blah, 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 just all different colors. <laughs> I'm and sorry, I'm like, what are they like? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's okay. Great. I hope that becomes a meme. We actually, yeah, great. <laughs> Someone's gonna clip that. Wonderful. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover a couple more uh, quick questions. One of them uh, from Frederick. He has uh, Intel 4790K. Hi, gaming, Frederick. Gaming in 4K. Mm -hmm. Will this CPU have better performance? That I mean, gaming in 4K. We can tell you. What'd you say? Um, across the board, obviously, having that much dated, like a Devil's Canyon chip, it's yeah. gonna be. It, it'll probably be a bit better. Yeah. But games, you, as we said, usually. At 4K, it's going to rely a lot more on your GPU. Absolutely. It's going to rely a lot more on GPU. Look at some of the benchmarks that came out for Ryzen 2 as well. That It shows a huge gap of 1080p, and then you get to 2K, and then the gap is smaller, and then you get to 4K, and it's minuscule. So, uh, I mean, I, I ran a 4790K before you know I, I jumped onto the current platform that I'm on, and it worked great. worked awesome. I had no complaints. It was just, again, one of those situations where my system sat stagnant without any changes for a while, so I'm like, right, i got to do something different. So okay, now uh, I'm gonna move because we basically answered the same way. Uh, Garwin from XDA Dev, the guys that we were helping with uh, the testing, like with all oh, the different yeah. platforms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he actually asked. He said, you know, thermal pad underneath the M2 cooler. Thoughts if it's removable? I left it off when did bit testing because bit test bench. I actually see the value in the cooler being the fact that I have seen uh, where M2 SSDs can definitely throttle, get a bit hot, yep. and even in a test bench environment, it's still mm -hmm. radiating heat away. It's helping soak some of that away from the components. Yep. I haven't done the specific thermal testing in this one because it's just a small chunk. It's not hooked to anything. Right. So as far as it sapping heat away, similar to like what you're we've seen with memory modules where yep. you have those heat shields that technically actually trap heat in on some cases, Yeah. and that can really suck. I think this is more of a substantial piece of metal that's going to get it away. However, the one side by product I could see is having a GPU right over it. There's potential for that heat to soak into that yeah. metal and possibly heat the drive it's, off. It's, it's going to roll over. And the one thing I will say about the M.2 uh, heat sink designs that I've seen and just the overall idea behind it, I was thrilled to see that they actually thought that far into the design and cooling of M.2s, especially with like uh, the Samsung uh, NVMe M.2s came out and the reports of overheating. Uh, also working with the, the support department, we didn't get a whole lot of, of calls about those drives overheating and having problems. We got a few here and there. Uh, but the thing I've noticed about things like that, especially like drives, it's, it's very similar to like hard drives where the product itself is not at risk for overheating, but not all cases are created equal, as we know. Yeah. And under the right conditions, you can kill an M.2 if the, if the cooling is just not just right, you know. So the fact that they even created that design and, and just didn't even leave it up for option, I thought was great. Yeah, and not to mention we've seen, like, I hate to, I, mean, I don't want this turned into, like, an Intel bashing session, but no, we've no, seen no, no. 600p and 6000p, and those things, the controllers on them run hot as surface of the sun. I mean, those things are super hot. They are. So having a, having a cooler capable of possibly dissipating some of that heat could really help, or at least dispersing it away from the, to maybe the NAND chips or to anything else besides having it on that controller. Sure. Where I've seen, where we've both seen smart errors after uh, after burn-in testing, we'll restart a system, and it'll literally be like smart air over temperature. No, right. Yeah, and you can also consider, too, for, for all we know, and, and maybe uh, the, the release date of the products don't align, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but for all we know, when Intel was designing 
those SSDs and they were overheating. They knew that the the features existed on those boards that would allow heat sink dissipation. So maybe they're like, we don't have to really focus a whole lot on making sure that the temperatures are low because it's going to be taken care of. It's kind of like designing a processor that's only going to work on a retail cooler, even though you know there's other coolers out there. Like, what's the point? I mean, so we'll give them benefit of the doubt, you know? Yeah. And then there's another question, uh, Garwin again. He says, uh, cooling second gen Ryzen. Is it worth doing a custom loop? Stay with the AO or a good air cooler do the job? I, I think I can speak to this because I've done a lot of testing on it. Is yeah. uh, Liquid cooling, I'm always going to be a proponent of that, even AIO, because liquid cooling keeps you from ever reaching the temperature, whereas a lot of air coolers, you get hot enough. You push that heat up through the through your, either your vapor chamber or your heat pipes. You push it up to the fin stack to push the heat away. The whole point of the liquid is the liquid carries it in a pretty efficient manner away from the cold plate before the CPU or GPU ever gets hot enough to really to really reach the um, thermal threshold until it saturates that liquid. Once it right. saturates the liquid, you start to reach a tipping point, but you still never really reach that threshold like you would with an air cooler. And I feel like if you're looking to get like a constant 4.2, uh, liquid's definitely the way to go. Even if it's an AIO, something like a 240 AIO should easily do it. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I'm biased on that subject. Uh, I want to look at cool all the things personally. Uh, professionally, if I'm working with a client and you know it's a, a matter of do or die, then I'll, I'll I'll tell them, yes, liquid cooling should be used, especially if you want, you know, if you're out in Arizona in the desert and dry heat and you just don't even want to deal with over overheating. Sure, yeah, liquid cooling, um, custom if you can afford it too, if you want to look pretty as well. Um, not, not against like you know Corsair or yeah. NCXT. Their, their coolers are pretty, mm -hmm. but sorry, you still don't have anything on custom liquid cooling, and I think you know that. Um, well, the overall thermal capability, the amount that you can dissipate with a custom liquid cooler, you can adjust that to best match your system. Yes. When you have an AIO, it works for what it's meant for. That's Absolutely. It. And Absolutely. And that's where I feel like there's value in both. I mean, it's really a matter of ease of use. Literally, an AIO, you don't ever have to change the fluid. You just take it, throw it away, get another one when it finally wears out. There's, this is true. Whereas we've seen what kind of fun you can have trying to drain uh, custom loops. Uh, but there's, yeah. there's some maintenance aspect there. There's some things you got to consider. There is. And often, especially with my loop, it involves me putting my mouth on a tube, which is unpleasant for a number of reasons. It probably doesn't look very great uh, to people from the outside looking in. Um, and I just I would prefer to not have to put my mouth on any tubes in my system, but it is what it is. I still remember you blowing out an avalanche all over the department one time. Uh, that was all, good stuff. All over my feet. I mean, it was at the end of the day, and <laughs> I was admittedly being a human being. I was a little tired. And before I knew it, the bottom of my pants were soaked and they were orange. So, felt great. Let me tell you. Okay, now one of one of the tough top. Uh, <laughs> one of the What's tough topics. One of the tough topics we're going to go right now is going to be is going to be uh, GPU shortage. This is actually <clears throat> a very painful subject for me, <clears throat> but I feel it needs to be mentioned. Is I think we might be with the uh, wonderful cryptocurrency deciding to take a uh, huge tailspin. Car yeah. Cartoon from my childhood. Woo! <laughs> but, uh, with this huge tailspin it's gone, and it's actually, we've seen a slight lighten up, but I still haven't seen the prices reduced. So the GPU shortage, we're able to possibly get more cards now because as great as it is, you know, we, even we, eventually, we had a stock of cards we had on hand, but the mm -hmm. GPU shortage has gone a long time, far longer yeah. than the previous one when we had the whole cryptocurrency boom where PSUs were all out of stock. You know. It's definitely gotten, uh, it's definitely gotten a bit more difficult with it going so long. Yeah. And then the MSRPs next thing you know go up, and so everyone who wants to game suddenly has to pay more for the same performance, and that's that's rough. So I'm really hoping that maybe with the next gen of cards coming soon. Maybe we'll see that kind of uh, take a step back again. I hope so. I really hope it's not going to become a situation to where, like, the likes of NVIDIA or, or even AMD kind of look at the situation and go, well, now that you're all used to this pricing, I'm sure you wouldn't mind if we only made everything $20 cheaper. Gee, thanks. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm also biased to the price hikes. I saw this coming when they mentioned the GPU shortage uh, before I even read it in the headline because if you remember, there was the... Uh, the flyers overseas for a lot of the major hard disk manufacturers and four terabyte drives. Yeah, four terabyte, <laughs> four terabyte drives uh, that were $160 became $400 within a matter of weeks. So then, you know, of course, there's uh, the memory shortages for the memory manufacturers' materials that have had 32 gigabyte kits uh, running at well over $500 now, and they used to be 280, 360, you know. I, I feel like it was kind of a primer. It was a little bit of a coincidence. Maybe I'm a little paranoid. Um, but I just I I hope agree. everything evens out. I just hope it evens out at some point, not just for my own personal sake and for uh, the people that I work with in sales, but just to, to the consumers. You know, I mean, like, can, it, it, everybody, it, we were just getting to a point with 
with PC gaming and, and the console wars uh, there within to where people were starting to be able to afford a, a solid PC game. You know, I built my brother-in-law uh, for his birthday, and, and you helped me, and, and again, I really appreciate it. Um, a, a PUBG machine because he was playing on the Xbox One, and it was a horrible experience. Um, and, and, and because I luckily had some hardware left over when price points were an acceptable point, I was able to build it, and it was really no problem. But doing that now, like, I couldn't really recommend to an individual such as himself, like, build a PC because, you know, it's only three to four times more expensive than an Xbox One. No big deal. It's just, it's, it's terrible, man. Well, but, you it know, makes me on. feel sad. Come on, what's wrong with consoles? You can always download a better GPU, can't you? I can't. I, I saw that thread. I saw that thread on Reddit. That hurt me physically. If I had four hands, I'd face palm with all four. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I actually saw. Remember, I shared that footage with you when they were first yes. releasing PUBG, and yeah, like just... you land and you just have like a blob, and it's like, oh, that's a building. Okay. Well, I saw. I saw an Xbox One. Like he's landing. I'm like, where are the buildings? It's a field. He's like, nope, they're there. Give it a second, and then he runs, and he's just running onto a field, and then he looks behind him at a, a, a massive 30 frames per second, might I add. And I'm like, oh, you passed like a U.S. and you passed the Dacia, but of course they weren't spawned yet, so you wouldn't know. The firefight aspect. Have you seen people get in fights with it? Yes. With, control, with controllers? It's like <laughs> it's, it's like giving a bunch of toddlers pillows. <laughs> just, just go to town. Because like, you, can, you can barely aim, and it's just... It, um, dude, that... That experience alone, PUBG and an Xbox One, would be enough for me to just throw in the towel in gaming overall. That's all there was. If I didn't know the experiences that were associated with PC gaming, I would just, well, guess I'm going to become a carpenter now. No more gaming? No. I'm just going to become a leather shoe master. I'm just going to build shoes for the rest of my life. Okay, PUBG on Xbox is like the Nintendo 64 version compared to PC version. <laughs> yes, I definitely agree. That is a fantastic analogy. Uh, uh, Garwin actually said, but uh, that's also where somewhere like you guys who offer some great value right now, when my nephew started to look at to build a PC, yeah. um, one of the first things I actually did was check your pricing, and um, especially since we're local to him. That's oh, yeah. awesome, but then okay. that's one thing we really try to uh, – that's one thing we really try to – we don't want to really – gouge gamers we want to make game we want to make gaming accessible to yes, everyone absolutely and we, that's something you can can you know i'll give you guys a little tip here in terms of my my professional forte i guess you can say if you call and you're interested in pc and you tell me you're getting into pc gaming and you haven't before that's a quick way to tug on my heartstrings and i'm very likely to give you a deal so yeah. just put it out there you know and, and everything's just out in the open i'm exposed and vulnerable so please by well, all means we're a company of gamers and we want to help people enjoy the experience of PC gaming as, as best as we can. Since since you're exposed and vulnerable, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mention Kevin's last comment, which is you mean Fortnite, which to me, before you say anything, <laughs> to, is 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 play school PUBG. I'll just say that because uh, as much as I tried to play it, uh, I have I have a very engineering mindset. So as you've seen, when I try to play something, <laughs> I either try to shoot things or I try to build something. You break. So, so I'm like, cool, <laughs> I'm going to build this real awesome house. And then someone comes by, shoots me in the head, and takes my house. And I'm like, glad I spent that ten minutes. I watched a guy just building, like, me and uh, me and Chad were playing the other night because yeah. PUBG servers were down. Chad, like, just, Chad actually just commented, too. That's the thing. No, we were we tried playing the other night because PUBG was down for maintenance. It was like, hey, uh, it's going to be for maintenance, or they're going to be on maintenance at 11 o'clock, uh, but 7 o'clock uh, out on the West Coast. We're like, what does that transla translate to? And I'm like, we have five minutes. So we jumped into a match. Died within 10 minutes, and then boom, servers were down. So we're like, I guess we could try Fortnite. And in one of the matches, I saw a dude in a spacesuit uh, just building an incline in the middle of the field. And I'm thinking, I'm like, all right, he's got an endgame. All he was doing was building it to protect himself. And he popped his tiny little uh, shielded head above one of the, the ledges and just shot me in the head with a sniper. And all I have is a shotgun, and I was just like, GG. But see, that's the thing. Fortnite right now is like the biggest game in the world, and the reason, and I think a big part of it is it's it's, 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 it's easy, it's easy to get into. Absolutely. Which Kevin said, his, his son Teddy loves uh, Fortnite. Yeah. And I agree. First of all, it's accessible because it doesn't have a lot of blood and violence. Yeah. Second of all, it's free. Free is a seller for anyone. Look at League of Legends. League of Legends has been the biggest game for like a really long time because sure, it's accessible. Anyone can play it. And the big thing is they have that very cartoony aspect, so it makes it fun for everyone. I, I don't understand PUBG kid. kid do a lot of great things to compete with Fortnite, unless they just don't care. Um, unless they kind of have an attitude that some people have in the industry when you talk the, about them, and, you know, about their competitors, and they're just like, ha they're not a competitor. Okay, anyways, moving on. Uh, they could do kind of some neat free-to-play ideas, especially because they have their crate system, and you have people that are just dropping 
uh, $2.50 on lock grades, which I've heard from the grapevine might be, you know, you might be that kind of person. So you can tap <laughs> hey, I like I like the little weird stuff, okay? I buy the... De- okay, yes, I, I buy yeah, the keys. a pen keys. with a target on it. I, yeah, I buy the keys because apparently that's a thing that I, I need to out myself for, but Chandler, I buy the damn keys. <laughs> if it helps you to feel better about your experience, that's all that matters. And I'll just tell you, so far I've got... all owns your soul. So far I've gotten, like, brown school shoes, so apparently that's worth my two fifty. <laughs> But um, we have one more thing I really think that's good to bring up, and this is because recently, you know, we were at GDC, GTC, mm. and a lot of people speculated there'd be a new GPU launch, and there was. There was the GV100. Unfortunately, it's not a GPU we want to we want to see as far as a game gamer. Yeah. That's more professional stuff, which we do offer. We offer workstations, so obviously that's in our wheelhouse, mm. MEVR, things like that. Right. But for gamers, since you have, since you have the capability now to... Make your requests known. We're we're saying this out publicly. Sure. What would be the what would be the couple things you would ideally like to see in this next gen of cards that would just make you happy as hell as far as what's launching? Right. And let's talk AMD and Nvidia because and, Nvidia is okay. getting our AMD is getting a little long in the tooth sure. with their uh, Vega and sad to say it just it didn't meet i mean i think the hype got so big it didn't meet that and that's where it's not necessarily their fault it's just it got out of control right so what would you like to see because obviously we want competition we've already covered that what do you love to see? man so many things the first thing that comes to mind in terms of, of features in nvidia cards i'd love to see more single slot cards i miss when uh, adam board partners uh, in collaboration with nvidia back in like you know this the 700 series and the yeah. 8 series where they had single slot cards so if you had a board that had the PCI Express lanes lined up in a certain way, and I know this is kind of a wash because four-way SLI doesn't exist anymore, and yes, <laughs> I still wish four-way SLI was a thing, regardless of its adoption rate. But because you can, not because just you need. because you can. Why not? Because I miss. I mean, truthfully, I miss having the customers that would call in and be like, "I want four Titans," and you're like, "Why?" Because I can. Awesome. Let's do this. Uh, I, so single slot cards for one. A and D. I feel like. I feel like they, they are where they used to be with NVIDIA all this time. Because you remember that M- NVIDIA would come out with the card or vice versa, and they were so neck-to-neck. And I feel like some point along the way, AMD fell like a year or two behind NVIDIA in terms of relevant tech and performance. And all they need to do is just take a, is just have a, a huge push towards beating them in their performance. Just, just push to get that performance where it needs to be. And then they can keep doing that, and it's great. Then you'll have, you know, someone, someone, someone please, cards. someone please record that sound. I, I need that. <laughs> I need a copy of that. A three hundred and fifty dollar card, and it's like, you know, I, I just, you know, reading the forums back in the day when I, I first started working for AVA Direct in two thousand and eight, and you had all the people that it's just you, you loved reading the debates between NVIDIA fanboys and AMD fanboys because it's like, ha enjoy that five performance difference for hundred fifty dollars more. You know, I, I miss having that. That doesn't exist anymore. So. Um, and then the, the last thing for NVIDIA that I would really love to see is I would love to see a single graphics card that can push 4K games at at least above 90 frames per second, especially now that I am a G-Sync fanboy and well, seeing the differences. Chad, Chad actually brought that up. He said in, he said in the chat, he's all, uh, cards will have to meet the 4K 144 hertz standard cropping up. Yep. Good luck. Absolutely. No, I know. Pushing 4K luck. at 60 on most games is like good luck. Well, you remember the, the, the rumors that were coming out like about three years ago when they started, when NVIDIA started putting out their nomenclature for cards. And Volta was one of the things brought up. And originally, a uh, word to the grapevine was we could see Volta within a year. And this was back in like 2015. And we were like, man, look at that jump in performance. That would have been awesome. And then once they kind of started to see the decline in, in, in competition, they were just, they never directly said it. But you guarantee there was somebody there that's just like, you know, they, there's no, you don't have to. There's well, no reason. There Everyone's have been, there it. have been a few news articles posted that uh, Jensen had said publicly that, you know, they, they're good enough for now. They didn't have to push it. And, and the cost, like whether it just, that was it's the, it's cost too much. It doesn't make sense. You whether know? that was actually a legit thing, I don't know. Haven't looked enough into it, but I do feel like, you know, right now the industry is milking, the certain players in the industry are milking their advantage. And I'm really hoping that just like what Ryzen 2 has done, where it's pushed people on their heels and made them step up, I'm hoping we'll see the same thing. I'm hoping that as we start to get an RTG option, Mm -hmm. maybe it'll push all the players to kind of take notice and start seeing other options because it's going to be better for first of all for gamers more more importantly because we're all gamers here so gamers is going to be uh, is going to get a huge benefit out of having the option. And now with the news that Intel might be making a discrete GPU. 
And Intel please. makes Intel makes please Intel makes die architecture. I mean, they make they make what the core logic could be right. to push a killer gaming card. So who knows? Maybe maybe within a year, you know, we'll be having a podcast talking about the newest Intel card. And maybe and I'll own one or two or seven. As, as much as hey, I have friends that work in all of these companies, so I hope them all well. I wish them all well. I hope that you know what we can be talking about awesome products from all of them, and right. we can get back to that uh, period of stasis where where you have all these options and there is not like a huge detriment to going one brand versus another. Sure. I, I just, I miss the days of healthy competition. And so if you introduce a third manufacturer to the mix of the, of the dedicated GPU market, by all means, please, you know, um, I, I miss the way things used to be. And I could just be holding on to something that may not happen. We're, we're getting old, Joe. I know. I'm, we're getting old. I feel old every day. And that's made apparent by my children, but in, <laughs> it's, and some people here, some of the youngins that work here, uh, yeah, don't even know who Burt Reynolds is, which is kind of weird in, in that regard. But oh, anyway. it's like when you reference certain cartoons and they're like, "What's that?" And I'm like, "All right, you watch SpongeBob. Never mind." Yeah, or you know, Knight Rider. You know, or you eat Tide Pods. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Should have said. <laughs> yeah, I, saw your, I saw your Twitter earlier. You were talking about the advertisements at Super Bowl. You're like, you missed a really good opportunity there with M and M's and Tide Pods. Like, oh, these yeah. are reading. These are not. Oh. It's a good call. That, that, hey, I, I'm just telling you. I mean, that could have been a, that could have been a great marketing opportunity for them. But I digress. It looks like we are actually running out of time because we gave ourselves about an hour and we're running a little over that. Thanks to Joe showing up a few minutes late to the party here, but that's okay. This is this is about the reliability you're going to expect when you see Joe on podcast. You may see him running and tripping over a cable because we have stuff everywhere trying to set up our new studio. Yeah, the, but next time I'm starting without his ass if he's not here right away. And you know what? Please do because at the end of the day, even though I, I do many things here at ABA Direct as, as you do and many other people uh, wearing different hats, uh, I was actually assisting a customer, and the customer will always come first, sir. <laughs> if that's not the cheesiest line I've ever heard, that's horrible. You got some crackers? Because I'll just slather it right on there. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, guys. Thank you to those of you who joined us. Thank you to those of you who asked us questions. Expect we will be uh, making a consistent schedule on Fridays to uh, me and Joe to come talk to you guys, maybe have some other special guests on, some of our friends even from AMD, Intel, and who knows who else. Maybe JJ from Asus will come hang out. I haven't seen that dude in years. That'd be great, especially if some people could even, like, kind of – we keep to a schedule with this. If people would pre-submit their questions and then we can run through those and answer a lot of questions too, that'd be great. Feel free to uh, message us on Facebook. We've got a, a wonderful young lady who uh, manages our Facebook, and she, if it's something that's specifically for a podcast question, be sure to state so when you uh, send it, and we'll reserve that. And if it's a good question and we really, you know, we want to talk to you guys, we want to help get information out there. So as long as it's something obviously we can't answer. If it's bound by NDA, sorry, you're out of luck. Yeah. I'm not I'm not going to burn those bridges. I nope. Mean. <laughs> nope. In this industry, there's so many bridges. You, you don't even, you just, no. No. Don't. <laughs> But thanks for joining us, guys. Yes, I appreciate it. Uh, this is Shannon from AVA Direct. And I'm Joe. And we appreciate you joining us. We really hope you'll join us next time. Have a nice evening.